Bending forward, I prayed that it was just a pop party balloon, but as I got closer, I realized it wasn't. My next thought was the disappointment that Casey was having sex in our house. She didn't have a steady boyfriend. Was this one of those, friends with benefits, they talk about nowadays? With my thumb and forefinger, I cautiously picked up the condom from the floor, lifted it, and stared. This condom was by no means used four months ago. The contents inside were still liquid. I'm no expert on these things, but surely this damn thing was filled no more than a week or two ago. My head was spinning, and I'm sure I yelled out loud, what the hell, what the hell, what the hell. I had to sit down on the bed for a moment. This condom could only mean one thing. But the thought of my Diana cheating was beyond my comprehension. We'd been married for 22 years, and she had never given me any reason to doubt her faithfulness. Sure, she's 43, and guys still flirt with her. The only little wrinkles on her face are laugh lines. She worries they age her. I told her they only enhance her natural beauty. She smiled that smile and kissed me when I said that. Her body is as toned as when we got married. Before this damn project, Diana was at the gym three days a week. Last spring, we took two weeks and went to the Bahamas. Diana turned heads in her tiny bikini. She even treated me to a topless day at the beach. That night, we made love like newlyweds. We didn't even bother with dinner. So why am I sitting on our daughter's bed, holding this damn used condom? I shook the cobwebs out of my head and went to the kitchen for a plastic bag. I put the condom in the bag, the bag in an envelope, and then stashed it at the bottom of the freezer in the garage. It's the only thing I could think of. Preserve the evidence just in case. Damn it, I didn't even want to think about the consequences of this. Divorce? Could I forgive Diana? What if she doesn't want forgiveness? What if she's in love with this guy? I was completely out of my element. This came out of nowhere. Like a robot on autopilot, I went upstairs and finished tidying up Casey's bedroom. Making the bed, I didn't come any closer to a course of action. I called my brother and asked if he had time to meet me for lunch. Dave works in the city. From his voice, he sounded glad to hear from me and glad to get the hell out of his office for lunch when I said I was treating. Dave and I sat in a booth. I leaned forward and lowered my voice. Dave, this is going to lead to nothing. This is just between you and me, understood? Of course, Al. What's going on? I told Dave about what I found. He sat there with his mouth open. Al, I can't believe this. Not Diana. She loves you, man. That's what I thought too. But how else do you explain what I found? It's just the two of us living in the house. The only guests we've had all fall were the Johnsons, and they stayed in the guest room. I don't think they would sneak into Casey's room for a quickie. What are you going to do? I think I'm going to confront Diana face to face when she gets home tonight. I can't imagine pretending like nothing happened. No, no, don't do that. Confronting her without evidence is the last thing you should do. Why not? Let me tell you why not. Two months ago, I came home from work early. When I walked in, I could swear I heard the back door close. At first, I thought it was Janet sneaking out the back, so I headed to the kitchen, but then I heard her calling me from upstairs. I went up and saw Janet in her robe. I asked her what was going on. Did I catch her in the act? I was furious. Janet blew up. She yelled at me for a couple of minutes. How could I accuse her, the mother of our children, of something like that? She tore into me for even thinking it. She shut me off from sex for three weeks. Three weeks without sex and very little kissing. It was damn cold in the house until she finally let me out of the doghouse. Sure, I still suspected. I didn't let on to her, but after that, I kept my eyes wide open. I don't know if Janet realizes it. I hope not, but for the past two months, I've been keeping a checklist. What's on this checklist? Check her closet. Check her phone. Check the bedroom for signs of sex. A couple of times, I unexpectedly came home for lunch. Paid closer attention to Janet's appearance. Any changes in her behavior? Any changes in our sex life? Where the hell did you get this checklist? Found it online. Amazing what's out there. I just googled, cheating wife, and all sorts of crap popped up, including the checklist. Throughout this conversation, our waitress kept coming and going, taking our order, bringing lunch, bringing the check. Throughout it all, I caught her listening in. Finally, when she brought our check, she leaned in and spoke. I caught my guy checking his phone. He and his side chick were keeping up a steady stream of messages. He tried to deny it, but it was too late, I dumped him. 
I left the restaurant not knowing what I was going to do. I sat in my study and listened to Rachmaninoff. Classical music always calms me and helps me think. Were there any other signs of infidelity? Anything besides one used condom? Of course, Diana worked late. Coming home late in the evenings and even stopping by the office on Saturdays. There were trips out of town. What did Dave say? Did her behavior change? It hit me. Last month, Diana spent an hour in the bathroom, soaking in the tub and primping. When she was done, she called me into the bedroom. I walked in to find her in a silk robe I'd never seen before. Diana melted into my arms and began undressing me. Go shower and shave. Hurry up. I was as hard as a rock when I entered the bathroom. A quick shower, a thorough shave, and I returned to the bedroom. Four candles were lit there, and Diana lay on the bed, the covers thrown back. I dropped my towel and joined her on the bed. We kissed, I unbuttoned her silk top and slid it off her shoulders. My hands caressed those perfect B-cup breasts. My fingers teased her nipples. We took our time, leisurely exploring each other's bodies. For 23 years, since the day I asked Diana to marry me, hers was the only body I'd touched, and I'd never tire of holding it in my hands, playing with it. I leaned in to pull off Diana's pajama bottoms. I was ready to, but when I pulled those pants down from her ass and slid them down her thighs, I got the biggest surprise of my life. Diana had shaved her mound and lips, completely bald. Diana had always been neatly trimmed, but she'd never been completely bare. I looked up at her, and she just looked back at me. A mischievous smile lit up her face. Do you like it? I was speechless. So, I've always enjoyed looking down at Diana. As I said, she's always neatly trimmed, so it's not like wading through the jungle where hair gets stuck in your throat, but this was something else entirely. I've seen photos of bald pussies, and we've watched a couple of porn movies where the actresses were cleanly shaved, but this was the first time I'd seen it in real life. I answered Diana's question by lowering myself down and kissing her. When she recovered from her first orgasm, she asked me, can we try something? Of course. Lie on your back. We climaxed several times in a row. We looked at each other and started laughing. Almost simultaneously, we said the same thing. That was amazing. Then we laughed a little more. Once we composed ourselves, we went to the bathroom and showered together, kissing all the while. That was a month ago, and until today's conversation with my brother at lunch, it hadn't even occurred to me that Diana was shaving for anyone but me. It's time for another investigation. Diana will be back home in a couple of hours, so there's no better time to start than now. First, I searched through her wardrobe, rummaging through boxes and bags. Nothing out of the ordinary, except for a new bikini in a Nordstrom bag, still with the tags on. Maybe that's what she wears for him in Phoenix. I'll definitely look into it the next time she's out of town. Then I peeked into her drawers. Again, nothing I hadn't seen before. No new frilly underwear, no nightgowns. No short dresses or tops I hadn't seen her wear. No hidden stash of condoms. By the time I finished my search, it was time to prepare dinner. It was a salad night, so it wasn't too difficult. I opened a bottle of Burgundy Pinot Noir and sat in the kitchen, waiting for Diana to return. When she walked through the door 15 minutes later, I couldn't believe this was the woman I suspected of cheating on me. She nearly dropped her briefcase, hugged me tightly, and kissed me deeply. Then I tasted wine on her lips. I'm so happy to be home. Two weeks with my family. I submitted my report this afternoon. It's done. I hope you don't mind. I took my team across the street to the Metropolitan and bought drinks. I had to thank them all for their hard work. I had one glass of wine and came straight home. She kissed me again. Oh, darling, I've missed you so much these past few months. I hugged her around the waist and pulled her close. I've missed you too. Does this mean you won't have any work for the next two weeks? No work at all? I hope so, but I wouldn't be surprised if a question or two comes up and I have to take a call. If I'm lucky, I won't have to leave. I promise to keep it to a minimum. I'm looking forward to two weeks with you and Casey. Did she call? I talked to her this morning. Her flight lands at 11, and we'll pick her up. Does she have plans for tomorrow evening? We discussed it. She'll have dinner with us. She's looking forward to home-cooked food. Then after dinner, she's meeting up with friends. She said we'll spend the whole Sunday catching up. Diana and I had a wonderful evening. We drank wine, almost finished the second bottle, had salad, drank two brandies, and talked the whole time. 
I almost forgot about my suspicions while we chatted. By half past ten, Diana was tipsy and couldn't stop yawning. Let's go to bed. I need a little sleep. Diana fell asleep as soon as her head touched the pillow. I didn't go to sleep. I wanted to read. An hour later, she was in a deep slumber, and I did something I'd never done before. I reached out and grabbed her phone from the bedside table, pressed the button to unlock it. It was locked. It took me at least two hours to fall asleep after that. The waitress's words haunted my thoughts. I caught my boyfriend checking his phone. Diana got up before me, and I smelled coffee brewing. I walked into the kitchen. Good morning, sleepyhead. How long have you been up? I'm sorry for ignoring you. I didn't realize how exhausted I was. I'll make it up to you when Casey goes out with her friends tonight. I promise. There she goes, being sweet again. Are these the words of a cheating spouse? But still, why is her phone locked? I decided to try a trick that came to me at 1 in the morning. I picked up Diana's phone from the kitchen table. Diana, I need to call Sandra's husband about that fly rod he put up for sale. Can I get her number from your contacts list? Sandra was one of Diana's colleagues, and her husband was an avid fly fisherman. I didn't wait for Diana's response. I just pressed the button indicating the phone was locked. Diana, the phone is locked. When did you start locking it? The password is the same as our garage door, 4002. I started locking it since I returned to my desk and found Kevin looking at photos on my phone. I left the phone on my desk while I was in a meeting, came back, and the little spy had the phone in his hands, scrolling through my gallery. He was so close, Diana spread two fingers a couple of centimeters apart, to getting fired. He already has a warning in his file. One more rule violation, and he's out. Maybe I didn't tell you because it was an HR issue, and we always treated it as confidential information. I entered, 4002, while Diana was speaking, and the phone unlocked. I would have fired him. You're too lenient. I probably would have, but his wife just had a baby. I hope he takes the second chance. Good luck with that. I wrote down Sandra's mobile number and would have to call later, just to continue my fishing rod story. Of course, I could always use another fishing rod. I didn't hang up. So, what's so interesting about the photos in your gallery that this guy almost got fired for? Diana laughed. Wouldn't I want to know? There are no photos of my lover in the nude here. No selfies of me. Just a couple of flower show pictures we went to with Janet last month, and some cute shots of Casey she sent last semester. Your wife is a nag. No naked photos of your lover? I couldn't believe she said that. I kept scrolling through her gallery, and she was telling the truth. Just flower and Casey photos. Who the hell is your lover? I hoped I asked that without sounding as annoyed as I felt. Diana laughed again. Why are you asking, silly? Who else could it be? This woman drives me crazy. We continued chatting about dinner menus and anything else, while I discreetly continued to browse through her text messages. Diana didn't pay attention, and I didn't find anything. We met Casey at the airport, and we spent the next two weeks on a wonderful family vacation. We went to the mountains and went skiing. We spent three days snowshoeing in the Medow Valley. Nights were spent in a rented cabin just a few meters from the Chewick River. Diana answered a few work calls and only spent one day in the office. The mystery of the hidden bikini was revealed when I opened my Christmas present from Diana. Two tickets to the Bahamas for early March. And I have something special to wear while we're there, she said, damn near embarrassing Casey as she held up two tiny pieces of fabric. Mom, please. I probably would have forgotten all about this condom mystery if not for my brother. I mean, Diana just showered me with love and affection throughout those two weeks. Diana and I threw a party, inviting many of our neighbors. My brother was there with his wife, Janet. They lived in the next neighborhood over with their two teenagers, twin boys. I like most of our neighbors. We're in one of the few neighborhoods in Seattle where people really take the time to get to know their neighbors and talk to them. That evening, there were about 12 couples at our house. One of the few neighbors I couldn't stand was Ed Parker. The only reason he was invited was his wife, Sylvia. She's such a nice lady that Diana insisted we invite them. Despite Parker being a braggart and a flirt. Not the fun kind of flirt, but one of those jerks you want to keep away from your wife because you know he'd sleep with her if your wife had bad enough taste to let him. During the party, Ed Parker drank too much and started running his mouth. He and Hank Johnson went out to the inner courtyard for a smoke. There's no smoking in our house. 
Diana can barely stand it outside, and Ed boasted to Hank about some wonderful pussies in the neighborhood. Dave was using the bathroom. The window was cracked, and Dave could hear Ed's words. It didn't go far because Hank got tired of Ed's bragging. He stubbed out his cigarette and went back inside. The thing is, ever since Ed got fired from his job at the bank, he's been a stay-at-home husband, and Sylvia brings home the bacon. So if there's a guy who has the time, opportunity, and inclination to sleep with any of the neighborhood wives, it's Ed Parker. The next day, Dave approached and relayed what he overheard. I was stunned when Dave asked, L, do you think Ed Parker was the one with the condom? No way. Damn it. I can't see Diana with that scumbag. She knows I hate that jerk. She thinks he's an asshole, and besides, I don't think Diana would cheat on me. But the condom, how do you explain that? I don't know. I just don't think it's Diana. Well, if it were me, I'd need to know for sure. I couldn't live with a cheating whore for a wife. Watch your language, Dave. You're talking about my wife. Sorry, still. Dave didn't finish the sentence. He didn't need to finish for me to understand his point of view. I thought about the used condom in the freezer. Could I get DNA from Diana and Ed to compare it to the DNA on the condom? It seemed far-fetched. And would it be real evidence I could use in court, if it came to that? I decided to take a simpler route. I was out of town for four days next week. If anything went wrong, they'd have plenty of time to take advantage of the situation. The clerk at the spy shop couldn't have been more helpful. Probably because I walked out of there with gear totaling over 1100 bucks. I could set up a tiny motion-sensitive camera in Casey's room. It would blend in among all the knickknacks on her shelf. Same deal for the guest room, now equipped with new radio clocks with cameras inside. Our bedroom was trickier. Anything new in the room would be noticed. I opted for a voice-activated recorder hidden under my nightstand. That should do. It was a tough week. Possibly the longest of my life. I talked to Diana every evening, and if something was up, she was the world's greatest actress. Nothing came out of her mouth except, I love you, or, I miss you. On Friday, she took the day off and met me at the airport. We grabbed Thai takeout from our favorite spot and ate it in bed after a welcome home fuck. The whole weekend was spent making up for lost time. Unfortunately, Diana had to fly out to Phoenix on Tuesday for the official signing of the purchase contract. I'm sorry it couldn't be done until you were out of town. The lawyers didn't finish with the paperwork until Wednesday. By the time the ink dried, it took the board a few days to organize the trip. I'm leaving Tuesday morning and will be back Wednesday night. Nothing we can do about it. I just hope this is the last major project for you this year. You've really been burning the candle at both ends. You did great, honey. I love this woman so much that all weekend I hoped and prayed that nothing would come out of all those recordings. On Tuesday morning, Diana left on her flight at 6 in the morning. I poured myself a cup of coffee and settled into the office to review the cameras and voice recordings. I started with the most likely room, Casey's room. The image came up right away. The date and time indicated Wednesday at noon. Two adulterers entered the room and immediately began undressing each other. I was horrified watching the destruction of at least one marriage and possibly two. I had no idea how Sylvia would react to seeing a copy of this video, which I had planned to share with her. After Ed undressed, she got on her knees and satisfied him, then lay on Casey's bed. They didn't bother pulling back the blankets. They just did it right on top of her blanket. I quickly fast-forwarded through the scene. I didn't need to see the details, but I needed to see how it all ended, and at certain points, I was curious to hear what these two were saying. Unpleasant comments directed at their unsuspecting spouses. So, I rewound, paused, watched, and listened, then fast-forwarded again. And here's what they did. I stepped back and listened. I want you to fuck me. Oh, how I wish we didn't have to use these damn condoms. I wish you could fill me up. I want to feel you. Why don't you just take the pills? That way, we could do without these condoms. Because my husband got fixed, and I don't want to risk him finding out I'm on birth control and I don't want to risk getting pregnant. I was freaking out like crazy when I had twins. I just waited for them to be born to make sure they were his. If they had turned out to be half Asian, it would have been hell. That was the last time I made a mistake by getting involved with someone of another race. How many men have you slept with while you've been married? My sister-in-law was outraged when Ed Parker came onto her. Janet pushed him away and answered his question. Not that it's any of your business, but you're number three. 
I like men. I like how my husband takes care of me and the twins. We have a good life, but he only satisfies some of my needs. That's why we need to be careful. He almost caught us in October. That's the last time we had sex at my place, and since your wife comes and goes all day, it's the safest option. Until my niece comes home. That's gonna be hard to explain. When she finished her monologue, Ed pushed her back onto the bed and started her again. I turned it off. I called Dave at work and asked him to come over after dinner. He came, and it didn't go very well. He cried for a while, and we drank too much. I called Janet and told her Dave would stay over at our place. I didn't tell her what had prompted his excessive indulgence in his desires, and she didn't ask. I won't go into all the details. On Wednesday, Dave and I took the day off. After he recovered from the hangover, we went to my lawyer's office and talked to their family specialist. Dave filed for divorce. Some things didn't go as she wanted. The twins turned 14, and they decided to live with their father. I was prepared for them to hear, rather than see, their mother's confession of betraying their father. Fortunately, that wasn't necessary. The boys preferred to stay with their father. Since Dave wanted to take the boys, the judge awarded him the house. He was supposed to pay Janet maintenance for two years, but over those two years, it amounted to only $1,200 a month. Sylvia divorced Ed using the video I gave her. She stayed in the house and he left. Thank goodness because Dave was looking for him. I heard that Janet tried to convince Ed to move in with her, but Ed said he wouldn't have anything to do with a cheating whore. Diana and I did everything we could to help Dave get through all the drama of that first year. Diana was especially helpful with her two godsons. They both relied on her as a confidant. Even Casey helped with her cousins after graduation in May. She spent the summer, her last stay with us before moving to Portland in September, giving advice from a female perspective. I'm getting ahead of myself. I must tell you what I found on the other video and on the recorder. Nothing. Well, nothing alarming, and actually, the recorder in our bedroom did capture a few of Diana's phone calls. At least half of the calls during my business trip. Diana talked to her mom, Casey, and her boss. I won't go into details. Let's just say this woman loves me, and I have nothing to worry about. Seems she thinks I'm quite the catch. I never told Diana about my suspicions. Some things are better left alone. Of course, now she knew about the camera in Casey's room. I made up an explanation. Told her I suspected Janet used a key she had from our house to meet Ed. I just needed to prove it. Diana seemed to buy into that explanation until almost a month had passed since all this shit hit the fan. Dinner was over and Diana and I had a nightcap after dinner, relaxing and reading in the living room. Suddenly, Diana looked up from her book. Do you think I'm cheating on you? Shit. I sat there, looking like a deer caught in headlights. Diana sat in her chair, staring at me, waiting for my response. Babe, come over here, to the couch. Let me tell you a story. I explained the circumstances. The filled condom, my conversation with Dave and the nosy waitress, the blocked phone, the shaved pussy, the overtime work, and the travels. It all lay on one side of the scale. Then I told her that all this time I never truly believed she could betray our marriage. Despite all these strange facts and circumstances, she wasn't that kind of woman. Diana looked at me. I could see she was trying her hardest to understand. That's the kind of woman she was. She hugged me around the neck and uttered the magical words. Alec, darling, I could never do that to us. I love you. And that was the end of it.